Marhaban wa ahlan bukum fi barnamij dakhil Washington. Ana mudifakum Robert Satloff. Lam yaksul velika min qabl fi al tarikh al amerikii. Al safahat al ula lil jarayid. Nasharat kisasan an shaksain. Rajul wal amra. Yak the man feel Mahkamatul Uriya feel Wilayatul Mutahida, Waklehama Minal Ark El Aswar. El Adid Minal Mokalat, Kenat An Katanji Brown Jackson, El Kadia El Liberalia, Eleti Wafaka Aleha, Majla Sushuch, Litakun Awal Amra Sauda, Takdimufi El Mahkamatul Uriya, Mundu Miatain Saba Warbain, Aman. Wal Adid Minal Mokalat, Tahadathat An Clarence Thomas, Al Qadi El Muhafid, Alevi Tu Ayid Zaujatuhu Al Nan, Navariya El Muamara El Janunia El Kaila, in Donald Trump, Hua El Faiz El Hakiki, Fi in Tahabet El Fain Wa Ashri. Havil Sbua Fi Barnamaj Dakhil Washington, Sanalki Nadra, Allah El Siasat Fi America. Min Khalel Hatain El Kisatain, Ma Rafiki Norman Ornstein. Welcome back to Dakhil, Washington. Two Supreme Court justices have been in the news, both Black Americans, two of the only three to serve or about to serve on the High Court. They're in the news for very different reasons. Let's take a closer look with my friend and brilliant political observer, Norman Ornstein. Norm, welcome back to our show. It's uh, so good to be back with you, Rob. So, Katanji Brown Jackson, who is she and why does she matter? So, she matters first uh, because of the enormous symbolism. This is the first African-American woman to serve on the Supreme Court. Now, the court doesn't have to be representative of the country as a whole. In fact, it's not in terms of religion um, uh, or other characteristics. But the idea that groups in the society that have felt less powerful, even powerless, been left out or been oppressed have seats on this most prestigious court, only nine people serving at any one time, has enormous symbolic significance. At the same time, there's been some controversy with some opponents, uh, particularly Republicans, saying uh, you're not picking the best person, you're uh, picking somebody because she is an African-American woman. But what we know from Katanji Brown Jackson is that she is an enormously deep and powerful intellect with deep experience, having gone to Harvard and Harvard Law School, served as a federal district court judge, and then on the most prestigious second court, the District of Columbia Court of Appeals, before moving to the Supreme Court. So while she was chosen because Joe Biden during the 2020 campaign, pledged that he would put an African-American woman on the court as a first. Uh, she also clearly has sterling qualifications for this position. Uh, President Biden said he picked her in part because of her, quote, lived experience. Uh, what makes her different from other justices in this regard? So there's little question, first of all, that if you are an African-American, you have suffered uh, from racism in the country. And if you're a woman and an African-American woman, you have sexism as well. That's part of it. But it's also that she was a public defender. She represented poor people, those accused of crimes, in a political system that's often tilted against those. We haven't had somebody with that kind of experience on the Supreme Court before. And that itself is an important part of her identity and what she'll bring to the table. One of the things that we've seen, Rob, is we have a, a justice appointed by Barack Obama uh, Justice Sotomayor, who is a Latino woman, and she also brings the experience of having lived in those environments for her life, so that when cases come up, 
even if you focus on what they mean in the narrowest sense and the law and the constitution, you know the real world implications of the decisions that you're making in a way that other justices whose lives have been more cloistered might not. Now that itself can be a controversial position, but the fact is that court decisions are not just something that have academic implications. They resonate deeply with people throughout the country. And if you don't recognize that, you're not likely to be a very good judge. So we just had the first confirmation hearings of a nominee appointed by a Democratic president in, in, in 12 years. What, what did we learn from, uh, from these hearings about Katanji Brown Jackson and about the Republicans who were asking her um, some very difficult questions? You know, it's interesting going into this, uh, of course, well, let's step back for a second and uh, get to your first point. We have had others who were nominated for the court by Democrats, in particular, uh, Merrick Garland. When unexpectedly during Barack Obama's presidency, uh, Justice Antonin Scalia died, leaving a vacancy, there was a Republican majority in the Senate. The Senate has to confirm uh, judges, including Supreme Court justices. And the Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, said, we are not going to let you fill this position, even though you have almost a full year left in your presidential term, uh, because it's a conservative and we're not going to let this position be filled by anybody other than a conservative. That was uh, a breach of the norms of the Senate, but that uh, happened. Now, as a consequence of that and vacancies that occurred in particular because the liberal, uh, very celebrated justice, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died right at the end of uh, Donald Trump's term. And they were able to confirm somebody completely different pattern uh, than what we saw with Merrick Garland, uh, confirming a justice eight days before the presidential election. That gave Republicans six of the nine justices on the court, six conservatives, a firmly conservative majority. So when Ketanji Brown Jackson's nomination came up because another liberal justice, Stephen Breyer said that he would retire somebody in his late 80s, then we expected, because the Republicans already had a majority, and because it was just going to be a replacement of a liberal by a liberal, that the Republicans in the Senate would be nice to her, and in part so that they wouldn't alienate African-American voters. And they're trying very hard, a group that's very strongly attached to the Democratic Party, Republicans trying to make inroads, that they wouldn't take a risk. But it didn't work out that way. It turned out that she had a rocky set of hearings in the Senate Judiciary Committee, as many of the Republicans were really nasty in their questions and pushed her hard, in particular on her experience as a district court judge and on a broader sentencing commission that looks at the nature of sentences, including mandatory minimum sentences, and these decisions involving sex offenders, people who had either possessed child pornography or committed crimes. Now, that sentencing commission in which she served had a majority of conservative judges on it. They made unanimous decisions but the Republicans attacked her for being soft on sex offenders and especially on child pornography. And that was true of some of the cases she had in the district court where she gave sentences that were not as harsh as they might have been. She had good reasons for uh, making the decisions that she made, but senators like Josh Hawley of Missouri, Tom Cotton of Arkansas, uh, Ted Cruz of Texas and Lindsey Graham of South Carolina hammered her over and over again on those decisions. And they've made it part of a broader attack on Democrats as supporting pedophilia, uh, child uh, uh, sex offenders, um, which is part of a broader political tactic. She handled it without losing her temper, 
She was very soft-spoken. By most accounts, she gave a bravura performance, but it was surprisingly nasty and difficult. And in the end, she got confirmed with three Republicans supporting her. Some of the Republicans who had voted for her for the D.C. Court of Appeals voted against her for the Supreme Court. And it's pretty clear that a part of this was Republicans, senators who are looking to possibly be their next presidential nominee, that includes Hawley, Cruz, and Cotton, uh, deciding that they would rather err on the side of exciting their own narrow base than reaching out more broadly to the electorate, including the African-American electorate. So can we, th can we say anything further about um, the three who did vote for her? And then perhaps a word about the one Black Republican, Tim Scott, in the U.S. Senate, who didn't vote for Ketanji Brown Jackson. So the three who voted for uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson, the three Republicans, are Susan Collins of Maine, Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, and Mitt Romney of Utah. These are the three who, more often than not, when we get bipartisan support for anything in our deeply polarized and tribal politics, are willing to at least look at voting with Democrats. They're not moderates, they're conservatives, but they're also not radical. Uh, now, Tim Scott is the only African-American Republican serving in the Senate. He's from South Carolina, just like Lindsey Graham. He was a leader for a long time in trying to find a bipartisan approach to criminal justice and police reform, but then in the end, drew back from that. His Republican identity has been stronger and his loyalty to his party's leaders like Mitch McConnell, stronger than anything that might uh, fit his own lived experience as an African-American man. When we come back after the break, we're going to move from a discussion of the newest member of the Supreme Court to a discussion of the longest serving member of the court in just a moment. I can't help myself. It happens every time there's a Senate hearing on a major nomination, like the Supreme Court hearings we've been living through in recent days. No, I'm not talking about being addicted to C-SPAN and watching every minute of the proceedings, a compulsion that verges on insanity when you consider some of the ludicrous questions senators are asking nominees these days. I'm talking about the instinctive desire I have to read or watch an American classic, the 1959 novel and subsequent 1962 film adaptation of Advise and Consent, perhaps the greatest fictionalization of Washington ever made. Starring a terrific ensemble cast of Henry Fonda, Charles Lawton, Walter Pidgeon, Burgess Meredith, and even featuring a young, well, not so young, Betty White. This is the story of the intrigue and machinations that accompany the confirmation hearings of a Secretary of State. It has everything you could want in a Washington story, a mix of power, greed, lust, subterfuge, compassion, vindictiveness, principle, and even a dose of integrity that makes for a thrilling saga. Hold it up as a mirror of our democracy, and it doesn't look so good, however. And these, one should recall, were the good old days. If you think the Kavanaugh or Jackson hearings were captivating, read or watch advice and consent. This is one case where fiction really is better than the real thing. Again, my guest today is Norman Ornstein. Norm is emeritus scholar at the American Enterprise Institute and one of America's wisest experts on politics, Congress, and the presidency. A native of the great state of Minnesota, he's a contributing editor and columnist for National Journal and the Atlantic magazines and an election analyst 
for BBC News. All right, let's move from a Democratic nominee to um, uh, the longest serving member of the Supreme Court, Clarence Thomas, second black man named to the court after Thurgood Marshall, a very different justice. Our instinctive view is to expect uh, black public officials to be liberal, but Thomas is the opposite, an arch conservative, Norm. How has Clarence Thomas's um, uh, personal story and public, uh, um, uh, public uh, service played in the black community over his years on the bench? So keep in mind that when Clarence Thomas was nominated for the court by George Herbert Walker Bush, he went through an extremely rough confirmation process. Uh, a conservative man uh, who had served uh, as the head of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. But as his confirmation process began, a woman who had worked with him in that uh, office, Anita Hill, came forward and said that he had sexually harassed her in a variety of different ways during his tenure there. A rocky confirmation hearing in which uh, Joe Biden was the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee at the time. And there was a real chance that Thomas would lose in this confirmation, but he angrily attacked the committee from his seat in the witness uh, uh, section, uh, calling it a high-tech lynching. And in the end, he was confirmed narrowly for the court, has proven to be uh, as a uh, conservative a justice as we've ever had. Indeed, in many respects, more conservative from the bench than Antonin Scalia, who was the most celebrated uh, person on the right wing uh, on the court. Consistently so, and in ways that have alienated him from the vast majority of the African-American community. Because while his life story was a pretty gripping one, coming from a very poor background in Georgia, where clearly he suffered some discrimination, he ended up at Yale Law School, but resented the way he was treated at Yale, believing that they looked down on him as an affirmative action person who wouldn't have gotten there otherwise. And he has lashed out against affirmative action and been very tough on uh, black defendants in the criminal justice system, been very tough on the death penalty, and does not represent the vast majority of African Americans, at least, although he's certainly in the mainstream of what is now a quite extreme right wing judicial philosophy. Uh, so, as a justice, he's anchored the right wing of the court. He is certainly not somebody, although he is clearly an African-American member of the court, somebody viewed in that light by most of that community. Absolutely fascinating. Thank you, Norm, for taking us inside the stories of, these, uh, of the current and will soon to be members of the Supreme Court, two ends of the political spectrum, uh, the two black justices who will serve on the court together. Thank you very much, Norm okay. Ornstein. It's baseball season again, my favorite time of the year. I realize this is the part of America most non-Americans appreciate the least. The game is slow, the rules are obscure, the focus on statistics can be maddening. I know I have achieved middle age because I actually enjoy listening to games on FM radio. And if you have to ask what that is, you definitely are not middle age. This week, please indulge me, because after nearly 18 years on this show, I'm going to do what I always wanted to do to mark the start of the baseball season. I'm going to don this hat and read my favorite poem, the time-honored classic of American literature, Casey at the Bat. This is the hat of the Washington Nationals, by the way. The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score stood four to two with but one inning more to play. And then when Cooney died at first and Barrows did the same, a pall-like silence fell upon the patrons of the game. 
A straggling few got up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to the hope which springs eternal in the human breast. They thought if only Casey could get a whack at that, we'd put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake, and the former was a hoodoo, while the latter was a cake. So upon that stricken multitude, grim melancholy sat, for there seemed but little chance of Casey getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake, the much despised, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had lifted and men saw what had occurred, there was Jimmy safe at second and Flynn a hugging third. Then from 5,000 throats and more, there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley, it rattled in the dell, it pounded on the mountain and recoiled upon the flat for Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing and a smile at Casey's face. And when responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat. No stranger in the crowd could doubt, twas Casey at the bat. 10,000 eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. 5,000 tongues applauded and when he wiped them on his shirt, then while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance flashed in Casey's eye, a sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood a-watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped, that ain't my style, said Casey. Strike one, the umpire said. From the benches black with people, there went up a muffled roar, like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him, kill the umpire, shouted someone on the stand. And it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult. He bade the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the dun sphere flew. But Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, strike two. Fraud, cried the maddened thousands, and Echo answered fraud. But one scoreful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain, and they knew that Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer is gone from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence, his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. And somewhere men are laughing, and somewhere children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey has struck out. Wasalna illa chetam havahil halkam in Barnamage Dachel, Washington. In Ken Ladekum Eya Asala o Taulikat Hawal Barnamage. While Bilachas Beshen Daur el Machamatul Ulia. Feel see a sad to America. To where salu mai aber Twitter, a la hashtag inside Washington. O to rasaluni mubasharatan, a la at Rob Satloff. Illa la cot feel a small cotton, hata delicate hain, shukran lakum, wa illa la cot.